Welcome to EWTN Live. I'm Father Mitch Packwell, and this is a program where we bring you guests from around the world. Tonight, we'll speak about the internal and external forces working to undermine the body of Christ and the growing hostility toward the Catholic Church and its teachings. Before we get to that discussion, though, we'd like to talk with the EWTN's Vice President for Programming and Production, Mr. Peter Gagnon, about Christmas time at EWTN. Peter, what Father. do you have for us this Christmas time? Well, we always um, try to make sure we stay focused on Advent leading up to the Christmas season. Yes. And, uh, but beginning on the 17th with the O Antiphons, we slowly start incorporating some of our Christmas programming. Mm -hmm. And so one of the programs we want to highlight this year is... Um, something we produce called Reclaiming the Carol, and it's um, the story where, in essence, Charles Dickens comes back to a, a stagehand who's been working on a production and kind of gives them the what for for why we've become so secular in Christmas and even even the story of the Christmas Carol, how that's become um, so secular. So we have a clip of it, and it's a production we worked on last year, and I think people will really enjoy it. So if you want to yeah, take a look. Let's take a look at that clip. Uh, Christmas. Well, Mr. Dickens, back in your day, you were Mr. Christmas. I wonder what you'd think of Christmas today if you were around. Probably like old Scrooge. <laughs> ah, humbug. Marley was dead, to begin with. What? What is this? There's no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, the chief mourner, the Scrooge signed it. Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Uh, who are you? What, what, what's going on? Yes, old Marley was as dead as a doornail. Uh, buddy, joke's over. I thought I locked that door. If you needed to come back and get something or, or practice, you should have let somebody in the theater know instead of giving me a heart attack. Mind I you, I don't know what is particularly dead about a doornail. I might be more inclined to regard a coffin nail as the deadest piece of ironmongery. What's going on? Who are you? Do I need to call the cops? Sir, I am Mr. Charles Dickens. <laughs> Charles Dickens, right, right. Yes, Mr. Charles Dickens, and I stand here before you with a purpose. Oh, a purpose. Oh, well, well, what purpose? A ghost, like old Marley himself, back from the grave. A spirit permitted to wander the earth. A repentant spirit, of course, as we all should be. But also an angry spirit, spirit of justice, inflamed to see what has happened to my Christmas carol, to see what has happened to Christmas itself. <laughs> so it's kind of a fun program. Yeah, it looks and, like uh, it'll be fun. Yeah, so it, so it uh, debuts tomorrow night and uh, will air um, throughout the, the Christmas week. Yeah. Um, another program we want to highlight is um, Father Leo Padalinghug, the Saving Our Faith um, mm -hmm. series that we have. We have a new episode. We just we aired one on for Advent. He did one for Advent, and now we're going to have one for Christmas. And um, where he he really celebrates not just Christmas Day, but the Christmas season. And throughout it, you know, he'll do great recipes that you can find online, and um, and just great insights as well. So people can you know share that with their families. It's a very popular show. And then finally, we want to highlight that we are going to be carrying all the liturgical events from uh, particularly, so we have events from the Vatican, from Bethlehem, mm -hmm. the Christmas Eve Mass. We have Masses from Washington, D.C., and obviously here with our friars. And then we'll have musical specials and, and programming for the children, for children throughout the season. So um, 
people can really enter into the season with EWTN yeah. and we can they can, should go to EWTN.com forward slash Christmas uh, and that gives information on the Christmas season but also there's a link on there that says Christmas programming highlights so people can click there and find out uh, what programs air in your area. By the way, the guy that's in this special about uh, the Christmas Carol, does he work in some of the governor's mansions? <laughs> I just, no, I don't just think so. Okay, I don't just, think so. Just wonder, just wonder. <laughs> All right. Good. Uh, yeah, with people not being able to get out as much. Absolutely. Things are getting closed down even mm -hmm. more now. So uh, we want to um, encourage folks to enjoy this season despite those difficulties. Exactly. Thank you, Peter. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes with tonight's guests, so please stay with us. Welcome back. We have a guest tonight. He is the president of Renewal Ministries, as well as the director of graduate theology programs in evangelization. He is also a professor of theology at Sacred Heart Major Seminary in the Archdiocese of Detroit. He is also the author of several books. His newest is entitled a Church in Crisis, Pathways Forward. This book addresses a number of things that a lot of us Catholics in the pews and even at the altar are struggling with, things like polarization in the church, oftentimes caused by ambiguous teachings, church-led initiatives that accommodate the culture without calling for conversion from sin to holiness. Sometimes Vatican-sponsored partnerships with organizations that actively contradict the teaching of the Catholic Church, just to name a few of the difficulties. Here to tell us more about that is a good friend of the network and a friend of mine, Dr. Ralph Martin. Ralph, how the heaven are you? I'm pretty darn good, Father Mitch, and it's great to see you again and be with you again. Despite everything that's happening, Jesus is Lord, right? That's what I preach. Yep. That's what I preach. You have been considering topics of crises in Christianity for some time. What was it, back about 1980 or so, you came out with an earlier book? Yeah, it was, it was called a crisis of truth, right. the attack on faith, morality, and mission in the Catholic Church. And I, I still hear from people who said that really helped save their faith, that helped save their vocation as priests, that it gave them a way of understanding some of the horrible confusion that was going on yeah. there after Vatican II. And so a couple of years ago, people began to say, you know, Ralph, I just reread your book. And you know, I think I think some of those same problems are back again, you know, and maybe you should consider republishing it. I looked at it. And I said, no, it's a different cultural situation. It have to be a whole new book. And I didn't think I'd have time to do it. But then COVID-19 came around and silver lining for me anyway, I had to cancel all my travel. Didn't go to Brazil, didn't go to Peru, didn't go to Ireland, didn't go to Rome, you know, plus lots of domestic travel. And I found myself with time actually to do it. Yes. And I think the Lord helped me quite a bit because I was able to do it in about two months. And uh, I, I, you know, I just felt like I was supposed to do it. You know, yeah. I, I never really write books just to write books. I'm not, I don't consider myself a writer. You know, I just, when I feel like the Lord wants me to communicate something, then I'll, I'll do something. So it's, you know, it's, it's many years in between books, you know, so this, this book came out now and it seems like it's making quite a, quite a impact. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you on writing a book. So I, I've written probably a few more books than you, but it's because these are questions that come up. 
right. want to respond to the issues and help people to understand things, not right. just in a cursory way by talking about it here or there, but giving them something to consider. That's the advantage of a book. To, you, you can even use it in prayer over it. And one of the nice things about your book is that you include in it lots of scripture so that someone who's going through it can not only get perspective. That's one of the things I like about what you do. You give perspective in that that's well thought out on a lot of the problems we have, but you also give a scriptural reflection that people can use to then say, what is the Lord asking of me? This relates to the past, but it's also calling me to stop whining or I'll give you something to whine about. Uh, no, that's <laughs> my mom and dad, sorry. But to, yeah. just to stop whining and to take action. Yeah, you know, that's exactly right, Father Mitch. I think you've expressed that better than anybody I've ever heard express it. Each of the chapters in the first part of the book, the six chapters in the first part, and it kind of lays out the problems, but it also gives the scriptural solution, like what the truth yeah. is about these areas that are really, really important. And then the, the second half of the book, the seven chapters, talks about pathways forward. But in chapter one, I lay out the whole bad news, you know, yeah. you know, and just almost so many different areas. There's such confusion, there's such conflict, there's bishops fighting with bishops and cardinals fighting with cardinals and whole bishops' conferences, it seems like they're heading off the reservation, going off the cliff, and other bishops' conferences saying, stop, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. And then there, there's things coming out of Rome that sometimes are confusing and what's going on. And I actually quote you, Father Mitch, in the book, where, where it says, uh, we're not stupid. That's an idol. You know, the whole Pachamama <laughs> thing in the Amazon, you know, I say, I thought that was one of the most pithy statements anybody ever said about that. But, you know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. And that picture was so disturbing to people, people venerating a little wooden naked statue, you know. And, and uh, so chapter one goes all through all these things and the doctrinal moral confusion, fighting within the church. But then chapter two, this is this you're going to like this. It says, is there a solid place to stand? Yes. And I say, we've got to recover our confidence in sacred scripture. Exactly. And the reason why this is so important is, first of all, it continues to be undermined. I, I hope you're not offended when I say that the head of the Jesuit order in, in Rome, you know, when he was asked about marriage and divorce, about Memorius Laetitiae, uh, he said, you know, do we really know what Jesus said? You know, were, was anybody there with a tape recorder? I say, oh, no, no, don't say that, you know, yeah. like, uh, you know, I mean, like you're taking away people's confidence in the very foundation of our faith. I mean, you know, you know, Scripture is the soul of theology. The magisterium serves the revealed Word of God in Scripture and tradition. It can never contradict it. And if you confuse the foundations, we're, we're sitting ducks for every wind of doctrine that comes through our culture. So in, in chapter two, I try to say, We've got to recover our confidence in the, the reliability of sacred scripture. And I quote Vatican II. A lot of Catholics don't know that Vatican II teaches a really high view of sacred scripture. In the Constitution on Sacred Revelation, uh, section 11, it says, everything asserted by the sacred authors should be considered to be asserted by the Holy Spirit. You know, that's God, you know, and to teach f faithfully, firmly, and without error those truths which God wished to consign to the sacred writings for the sake of our salvation. So this is there for our salvation. The Lord's trying to save us through what he's revealing to us in his sacred word, and we've got to recover our confidence in the word of God or we're, we're sitting ducks. But And the, the other thing, too, though, that the same document makes very clear, as did the, um, uh, the letter by uh, uh, Pope Benedict, the 16th, that was really a reflection on the Vatican II document, the Constitution. It's not just a document. It's a constitution on revelation. Yeah. Yeah. Not, it's not even on scripture. It's on revelation because right. it's that three-legged stool of stability, the sacred scripture, apostolic tradition, and the magisterium of the church. 
Right. These are three legs of a stool that give a firm basis for our faith. I even had uh, a phone call yesterday on my scripture and tradition course uh, program in which somebody said, well, I understand that you looked at the Bible analogously. And, you know, I didn't understand the question. I thought about it later and it's relevant to this topic, that uh, she, she thought I was using it allegorically. And I said, well, yeah, there are allegories there. I know you can see types, typologies and stuff. That's, there are allegories. But I think she was afraid that I look at the Bible only as an allegory and not as something true, yeah. which is not something right. I hold. You know, I... Right. I'd rather be executed than deny the truths of Scripture, you know, the, the, the yeah. resurrection, the virgin birth, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, tr truth comes in the particular literary forms of the Bible, but sure. truth comes. Exactly. Yeah, truth comes. Exactly. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, so that there should be no... But, but the problem is, I'm sure she's coming from a, a, a place where some teachers maybe even priests from the pulpit, have said, oh, it's only an allegory. You don't have to really believe that it happened. Right. That's, that's right. where I think a lot of people are coming from. Because uh, yeah. in this, not where you teach, but in some seminaries, people were taught that it's not true. That's really true. And I'm, I'm happy to be teaching a seminary where things are really solid, you know, and we really are teaching the faith of the church, yep. teaching scripture like it should be taught. But, uh, you know, sometimes, Father Mitch, when, when I'm giving a talk about some of the more challenging things of Jesus, like about sexual morality, for example, mm -hmm. or about him being the way to the Father and the only way to the Father, or, or about the final judgment or, mm -hmm. you know, heaven and hell, you know, sometimes people will come up to me and say, my Jesus would never say that. <laughs> And this is a little scary mm -hmm. because there's not a lot of people going around making little wooden statues and venerating them, although some are. Uh, but there's a lot of people making a Jesus in their own image, you know, making up their own religion, yeah. you know, picking and choosing from what God reveals to us to suit them, which is a form of idolatry, which is a form of profound rebellion against God and arrogance of the creature, putting our poor minds and hearts and wills against the mind of God, you know, and the mercy of God and actually letting us know what the truth of reality is and what the truth of our life is and what the purpose of our life is. And so it's really scary to me when people are picking and choosing from Scripture and picking and choosing from the teaching of the church. And we can't have the real Jesus if we don't have his teaching. It won't be the real Jesus. It will be a Jesus we're making up as an idol to confirm us in our disordered desires. I, th on that line... I urge people to take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. When St. Paul says, I presented you as a virgin bride to Christ, but some of you are listening to another Jesus. Some of you accept another spirit, and wow. some of you accept another gospel. Wow. And that is key here, that we have to be alert that there are many other Jesuses, but it's only the Jesus of the four gospels that is the true Jesus. Amen. And these other are false Jesus. And you will be judged by the real Jesus, not by the Jesus of Gnosticism, or the Book yeah. of Mormon, or the Quran, or any of these others. It's the Jesus of the Gospels that is our judge. I am writing that passage down. I just wrote it down, Father Mitch. That is fabulous. I'm going to be using it going forward. That's a fabulous text you just gave us there. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's a very important text. Because we, we see the reality of many different Jesuses. But there's only yeah. one who's the Word of God made flesh. Yeah, and then Paul says, I think, in another place, and you probably know where it is, where he says, even if an angel comes and give you another gospel, don't believe him. Even That's if Galatians. I come to a different gospel, don't believe me. Galatians where 1, verses, I think, 3 or 4. Okay. Yeah, I mean, Preach Paul that knew, gospel. 
from the very beginning of the church, the Lord permitted false teachers, false prophets. Uh, he permitted confusion about doctrine, you know. And there's a, a professor at our seminary, uh, Dr. Peter Williamson, who I think it's 1 Corinthians 11, he says, there must be division amongst you so that the true doctrine will stand forth. Mm -hmm. You know, that there's almost like, and this is one of the things I try to say in the book, yeah, we got really big problems in the church, we got really big problems from, coming from the culture. Mm -hmm. uh, there's powerful forces on a global scale that are trying to suffocate or co-opt the church and turn the church into a chaplain for a global reset, you know, to bless the global reset, mm -hmm. to uh, bless a very secular, totalitarian, elitist kind of domination of the world. And, and the Lord's permitting that, but he's got a plan to bring good out of it. He's got a plan to bring good out of it. Maybe he wants wickedness to be ripened and manifest itself so it can be judged, or maybe he wants uh, confusion to reign so people are going to have to make a choice who they're going to believe and, and then maybe turn more fervently to the real Jesus and the real church and, and really find the safety and security and peace there that, that only, is only there. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I I'm not discouraged about what's happening. I'm troubled by what's happening, but I'm not discouraged because I think that we all know that nothing happens without the providence of God. He's permitting evil and wickedness to, to win in a certain way, but he's got judgment in mind, and judgment is coming. And he's also got a purification of the church coming, and that purification is coming. I, I sense even on the local level that people who are continuing to come to Mass are coming with greater intentionality, like they know that they need Jesus more than ever. They mm -hmm. need the true church more than ever. So I'm, I'm sensing kind of like a, a heightening of intentional commitment and intentional fervor that, that wasn't there before because before of all these terrible things that are starting to happen. Sometimes, you know, when you mention that the Lord allows the evil to go its own way, um, the way sometimes you have to allow an infection to develop, you know, like, I don't know about you, but it, you know, I already started getting cataracts. They have to let it finish growing before they can remove it. They, they can't take <laughs> yes. it when it's too, too soon, right? Yes. Uh, well, you yes. may not know yet, but <laughs> this happens. And I think about the, uh, the, the a more relevant passage is in Mark chapter 5, when our, the man with the legion of demons tries to get Jesus to stop the exorcism, and then the demons beg to go into the pigs, and he gives them leave, and then they destroy the pigs. <laughs> and what we saw in this, the last century is that National Socialist Workers Party, the Nazis, and the Communist Party were allowed to let their evil go its full course, and then they self-destructed. -destruct, they destroyed themselves, many others too. We have to be alert, not to allow ourselves to be moving with the evil, but resisting right. it. And knowing that just as surely as the demons destroyed the host pigs, they wow. will destroy themselves. And this is inevitable. This is great. I, I feel like this dialogue is really, uh, really helping me kind of like see more deeply even to what I'm already talking about in the book. And yeah. you know, I have a chapter in the book in part two. It's called Powers, Principalities, and Organizations, where this is not just a political issue or a technological issue or, you know, global government's issue. This is a spiritual issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, there really are powers and principalities that are increasingly gaining control, yes. increasingly gaining control. There's demonic forces behind what we see happening. I don't think things could be happening as rapidly as they're happening, as coordinatedly around the world as they're happening without an intelligence that more than human and a power that's more than human that's really behind this. And so they work, though, through people and through organizations. They actually use the examples of Nazism and communism as ways in which Satan really worked in a powerful way to uh, destroy people. We know he's a liar and he's a murderer, and he deceives people through false promises 
and terribly unrealistic uh, presuppositions in order to destroy us, in order to destroy the world. So, yes, we, we have to put on the spiritual armor. And one of my greatest sadnesses, sometimes I, and I, I'm in church on Sunday or some other day, and I feel like so many of our fellow Catholics don't have the spiritual armor on. They're not protected. You know, they don't have the, the helmet of salvation. They don't have the breastplate of holiness. And most particularly, they don't have the shield of faith, which extinguishes the fiery darts of the evil one. And all day long, the devil is firing fiery darts at all of us. Uh, temptations appealing to our, our flesh, uh, peer pressure from the culture, uh, demonic lies that are being inserted into our mind. And if we don't have the shield of faith, we're, we're sitting ducks. We're going to be we're going to go over to the enemy's side without even knowing it's the enemy, without even knowing that we switch sides, because there's people who are even now coming to church, not with the mind of Christ and the spirit of, of God, but with the mind of the world and the spirit of the age. And if we don't have the shield of faith to extinguish those fiery darts, to extinguish those lies, and, and I think there's two dimensions to the shield of faith. One is complete trust in who Jesus is. Exactly. And I think that divine mercy thing, Jesus, I trust in you, is so important, no matter how confusing things are, no matter how painful things are, no matter how disappointing things are. Jesus, I trust in you. But it's also, the shield of faith is also the actual revelation of Jesus, the actual words he speaks, the actual truths he tells us, the actual warnings he's given us. And if we don't know the word of God, we're not going to be able to counter the, the counterfeit lies of the devil, just like Jesus did in the, in, the, in the temptation in the desert. He said, God's word says, and we need to know God's word. So we have, like you said, the real Jesus, and we have a truth that can actually overcome Satan. So I'm so concerned, Father Mitch, that people don't understand the, the fiercely raging spiritual war that's trying to gain control of the world, trying to silence the church. And, and so many of our leaders, so many bishops and priests are, are intimidated. They, they, they're, they're triangulating. They're trying to work out political solutions. They're trying to find new programs that could kind of reverse the decline. And, and, and that's why in part two, I say what we got to do is we got to stop pretending that everything's okay. We've got to stop the false official optimism that we have a vibrant, thriving church. Some places we do, but many places we don't. And every year, the, those Pew surveys and Gallup surveys show that Catholics are more and more taking on the mind of the world and the spirit of the age and not even believing what Catholics have to believe because it's true, you know? And so we're seeing something, and this isn't just statistics, this is souls. I mean, people are being lost. People are being carried off into captivity. And I, that's one of the punishments we read about in the Old Testament. Your sons and daughters are going to be carried off. The sons and daughters of the church are being carried off by the world because I think sometimes we're not getting a clear sound from the, from the trumpet. You know, Paul yep. said, if the trumpet doesn't give a clear sound, who's going to rally for battle? And right now, our shepherds seem, in many cases, intimidated, uh, scared, not knowing what to say, kind of being quiet, hoping for the best. In the meantime, the people are being carried off. I think it's a combination of some of the leaders inside the church are intimidated. Some of them believe that they can have more influence if they go along with some of the people, especially in politics, who themselves are going along with super wealthy people. And that's what they're unwittingly, I think they're supporting the super multi-billionaires around us. And, yeah. the, we, and then you have folks who, in their anger and frustration, overreact. I and mean, you discuss that. Now, some people say, well, th that bishop and that pope and all these people are heretics and I, we need an anti-pope. Yes. Everybody. Yeah. Spread out, as Mo used to yeah. say. And we yeah. have to deal with that. Now, I need to take a break right now. We want to come back and continue this discussion. I uh, just want to let folks know that if you want more information on Ralph's work, you can go to renewalministries.net, renewalministries.net. And Ralph, we'll be back in just a couple of minutes and we'll continue on with this discussion.
Welcome back. We are talking with Ralph Martin about his brand new book called A Church in Crisis, Pathways Forward. You can get this at EWTNRC.com. It is item number 238. Number 238. Uh, it, it, it's really well done. Lots of great information, but also good material for prayer about how we deal with this crisis. Let's start to take a look at some of that issue because you do spend a lot of time. What do we do as we go yeah. forward? Um, what would be some of the first things you would recommend? Yeah. Can I just say one thing? I'm sure. kind of excited about the cover, Father Mitch. Could I, could I just show folks the cover? Sure. I mean, it's, it's kind of like, I don't know. I just feel like the Lord gave us this for the cover because it's Notre Dame burning, you know? Right. And I was I was in a meeting. I'm a consultor to a subcommittee, of the bishops on the catechism, and I was in a meeting there. And one of the one of the one of the people that worked there said, "You know what? The church is burning," you know. And I just felt like, "Wow, you know, we just chose that as the cover of the book." And so I feel like the church is burning, but it's burning to purify the church. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we were just talking about before the break is that. This polarization happening right now in the church. Like right now, I'm concerned because people who are Orthodox Catholics are, are sometimes fighting each other rather than kind of working on the same side, you know? And like you were saying, that sometimes people are so concerned about some of the confusion in Rome or some of the uh, division even within the United States uh, and other countries uh, that they kind of start like kind of retreating into a, a place of suspicion and fear and, and condemnation where. You know, I've even heard people say, you know, like the Pope is a heretic or all the bishops are this or that. And it's just not true. You know, it's just not true that he's teaching formal heresy at all. You know, it's just not true that all the bishops are one thing or the other. There's lots of good bishops. There's lots of good priests. Uh, and, and some people are like saying we got to even kind of diss Vatican II. We got to go back before Vatican II. And you can't you can't delete an ecumenical council of the church. Every single document was approved by like 98% of the bishops there and approved by the Pope. I mean, you're no longer a Catholic if you're if you're doing that. You're, it's the Protestant principle operating again, where you're placing yourself in judgment over the authentic magisterium of the church. So I am concerned about that. I just would like to make an appeal to people. Let's stop fighting each other. Let's start talking to each other. Okay, let's start talking about our liturgical differences and our liturgical preferences. Let's try to reach an understanding there, even if one people prefers this and somebody else prefers that. As long as it's within the ambit of what the church permits, let's stop condemning each other and let's start facing outward to be a witness to Christ in the culture. Something along that line, you and I both grew up in the pre-Vatican church. You know, we, that's when we were uh, children and young men. And a lot of people forget that some of the problems that they have were posed by people raised in that pre-Vatican church, and they were saying these things well before the council. That's one thing. Secondly, uh, so the problem is not the council. It's people who had a crisis of faith, and I would say a lot of that crisis of faith came from the response to the world war and the, the, the psychological depression that permeated the world afterwards. Uh, the, 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 that was part of it and the, it showed up with existentialism and a lot of other things. But there's something else that we also have to keep in mind is that with a lot of these problems that people are sometimes criticizing, this guy is this, this guy, can you do anything about it or are you simply gossiping it may be true, I don't know, maybe it's not, but are you simply saying this stuff to get your anger out and then causing other people anger and doubt? Or are you doing something to address the issue? And if you can't address the issue of a particular cardinal or bishop, there's nothing you can do about it except right. rant. Then right. cut it out and do what you can. Oftentimes there's a prideful delusion of grandeur 
that if I say this, I'll change it. Maybe, but I know I have to limit myself to what I can do. Right. And teaching what is true is a better thing to focus on than to focus on the uh, problems other people cause. Unless right. I can do something about it. When I can, right. I'll get them. But if I yeah. can't, let me do what I can do. Right. And I, I have two chapters there. One's on repentance. Yep, exactly. And I, talk, and I talk about our personal responsibility to do an examination of conscience. To what extent have we allowed the world to influence our thinking? To what extent have we begun straddling the issue? To what extent have we kind of actually denied Christ by inappropriate silences when mm -hmm. to be silent is to kind of confirm somebody an immorality type of thing. So mm -hmm. I talk about doing an examination of conscience. I go through a lot of things there. But I also talk about how corporately we really need to do that as, as parishes, mm -hmm. as dioceses, as a church. And I talk about the uh, very serious effort that the Archdiocese of Detroit is making to kind of turn the ship around, as it were, from a, a, a place of kind of confusion and, and unclarity to a place Archbishop Vigneron now calls it changing the DNA of the archdiocese to a DNA of evangelization. Mm -hmm. But he also knew that there's been a lot of junk going on in Detroit over the years, and we really needed to be honest about that. We needed yep. to really come before the Lord in a, a solemn liturgy of repentance. And so he did that, and he he really listed quite a few things that we have really been unfaithful to the Lord about in our archdiocese over many years now, including allowing false teaching to go, mm -hmm. uh, including racism, where many Catholic parishes wouldn't accept African-American parishioners and just other really, really important things. And so I, I go through that. I, I, I have the whole ceremony of repentance in one of the chapters there, but I also put in something that John the Baptist puts in. Make sure you bear the fruits of repentance Make sure this is not just a one-time liturgical ceremony, but be there continuing examination of conscience to make sure we're not drifting back into the things we just repented from. Mm -hmm. Then I have another chapter called The Time for Action, where I, I talk about every layperson having a responsibility to take action in their sphere of responsibility, which is exactly what you were talking about, mm -hmm. Father Mitch, mm -hmm. in our families, uh, you know, making sure that we're we're guarding our families from false teaching, that we're leading them into, you know, good waters where, where the Word of God and the, the sacraments of the church are available to them. But also, uh, when we hear something in a parish from a sermon from a priest or a deacon that we feel like is drifting from the faith or confusing people, rather than just going on to the next parish and, you know, washing the, you know, shaking the dust from our feet, go to the priest or the deacon and go respectfully and go humbly and say, you know, father or deacon, you know, what you said last week sounded a little bit like you were like blurring the teaching of the church in this particular area. Did I hear you right? Because we may not have heard right. You know, exactly. we may not, we, and, and certainly the, the priest may not have intended to give that impression. And he may be grateful that we told him that, we think people got this impression. He say, well, thank you for telling me. I'll make sure. Do you think I should clarify that? And we say, yes, I think you should clarify that, Father. You know. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if the priest blows us off or the deacon blows us off and says, you know what? The church has got to move with the culture. The church has got to change with the times. You know, We're moving in a different direction. The church is going to change its teaching on this. It's just a matter of time. <laughs> then we've got a bigger problem. Yeah. Then we need to go to the bishop. Now, I, I, I tell people in the book, look, the bishop's not going to be happy to hear from you. The bishop doesn't want to hear that anything's wrong in any of his parishes. He doesn't want to hear that anything's wrong in any of the preaching of his priest. Because in a lot of dioceses, there's a tremendous priest. And, and bishops say, I don't know what I'm going to do. In fact, I went to a bishop once to talk to him about a problem in a parish that I had contact with. And he said, I know. I, I've told that pastor to stop doing that. And uh, I guess I'll just write him another letter. I said, Bishop, another letter isn't going to be effective. You know, yeah. he said, well, look, here's, here's my problem. You're either going to have a bad priest or no priest. What do you want? Well, I'd say I want a good priest, even if it means preaching in a stadium. You know, I, I don't want anybody undermining 
the salvation of, of my fellow Catholics, you know. But a lot of a lot of bishops aren't ready to make that decision yet, and they're not willing to exercise the discipline that they need to 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 make sure that their people are not being misled. One of your colleagues at the seminary in canon law had a very wide. We were he and I were colleagues at University of Dallas some years ago. Mm. He had a great line. He said, "No man." should accept becoming a bishop unless he's willing to be the only priest in his diocese. <laughs> wow. And his point on that is, if uh, what, what you said, if the bishop has to rent a stadium at a local college or high school in order to be the only celebrant, but that the gospel of Jesus Christ is being preached authentically mm -hmm. and not falsified, then yeah. it, he has to make that decision. It's not easy. No. And we've had a number of bishop saints, um, P, um, Peter Damien and uh, Robert, um, um, oh, not, not Delaman, uh, the, the bishop of Milan, uh, comes oh forget, yeah yeah skips yeah. my mind this is part of he's one of those old timers things but uh, anyway he um, they were priests tried to assassinate them Archbishop for bringing Charles, reform. Uh, Charles Borromeo Charles yeah, yeah. Borromeo yeah. not Robert yeah. uh, Charles Borromeo uh, Saint Charles Borromeo they, they shot him in the back while he was uh, going up to celebrate uh, a benediction. Now, yeah. in those days, at least they had good vestments, good quality stuff. It stopped yeah, uh, the uh, bullet because uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, it was uh, thick uh, enough. Those old blunderbusses didn't have as much power as today's rifles. But, yeah. you know, he took a bullet, uh, uh, blunderbuss bullets in the back, you know, because the priest didn't want to reform. But yeah. he went on and did what he had to do, finish benediction, too. Yeah, that's great, yeah. No, and we need to pray for our bishops and priests, don't yeah. we, Father Mitch? Yeah. Honestly, we really do. They're under such tremendous pressure. We, we can hardly imagine the pressure they're under, the competing interests that are pressing on them, the, the big consequences for the decisions they're going to make. And we just really need to pray for our bishops mm -hmm. and priests. Ask God to have mercy on them, to strengthen them, to encourage them. I actually hope this book will do that. Uh, I actually got a letter from a priest just a, a little while ago saying, your book has helped me so much. I just didn't, I couldn't name what was going on. I just felt unsettled. I just felt uneasy. I, I, I couldn't explain what was, what was bothering me. All these things happening, ambiguity and confusion. And your book really let me name them. And I feel free now. And I feel clear now. And what you gave me in terms of scripture and the, and the, the truth about these issues has empowered me so much. And I've already given three sermons on the evil fog of universalism that undermines our commitment to holiness and undermines our commitment to evangelization, undermines vocations. And so I just felt like, yes, that's why I wrote the book. I want people to be delivered from fear, confusion, anxiety, given confidence in Jesus Christ, and be able to go forth with confidence in the Word of God. And my favorite chapter of the book is the last chapter, which talks about the inexhaustible riches of Christ. You know, you know, people say, Ralph, are, are you discouraged? You know, you probably know more about what's wrong going on than a lot of people. I say, no, I'm not discouraged at all. I'm actually excited because I know the hand of the Lord is over this. I know the Lord's got a plan here. And I know that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is the same. Nothing has changed. Mm -hmm. He's the same today. He's the same yesterday. He's the same forever. And we can put the whole weight of our life in trusting him and believing that he's going to bring good out of this apparent mess. Yeah. This, this is some of the elements that we have to keep in mind. The truth that it's God, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, who became flesh and dwelt among us, redeemed the world with three hours of hanging on a cross. And Archbishop Sheen said, a uh, wonderful perspective. Jesus spent 30 years obeying, three years teaching, and three hours redeeming. 
He could yeah. bring so much good out of that. Yeah. And because it's infinite God who's active, we cannot forget the reality of our faith and the one in whom we have this faith. That it's Amen. the infinite God through whom the universe came into being. And without him, nothing was made. So if he can do all this great stuff, um, I'm, I'm good with going forward. Yeah, amen. Absolutely. And there's a chapter in the book which talks about a time of judgment, a time of prophetic warning. And it's amazing how Archbishop Sheen is being rediscovered today. Yes. Like, I, I rediscovered the, in doing research for the book these, these addresses he gave years ago about the Antichrist. And it's absolutely breathtaking yes. how applicable it is to today. I included in that chapter on the coming judgment and prophetic warnings, and his 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 insight into how Satan is going to try to kind of create a false religion and uh, a false Jesus, and just what we've been talking about. I mean, it's it's uncanny. I mean, his his profound spiritual insight into how the enemy is going to work to try to try to subjugate the church and uh, lead so many souls astray. And uh, it's, it's the Lord's blessed us with his insight. The Lord's blessed us with our church of Sheen. The Lord's blessed us with other prophetic voices that uh, I, I talk about in the chapter, including Father Michael Scanlon, who's yeah. a friend of the network and yeah. his prophetic word, you know, so. A friend of both of us too. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. I, I also would urge people to help get an imaginative sense. You lay out the facts really well. For an imaginative sense, I would recommend a novel by C.S. Lewis called That Hideous Strength. Yes. It's the yes. third part of his Outer, uh, uh, Outer Space trilogy. But this one occurs on Earth. And he really portrays well the kind of situation where niceness is used to camouflage deep set wickedness. Yeah. And that we can't let niceness get in the way of truth because it's camouflage for what's evil. You know, I'm amazed that you mentioned that because uh, I thought of that hideous strength when I'm seeing some of the developments that are happening in our yes. world today, and I read our Shishov Sheen's thing, and I read it years ago, but my wife and I listened to it on an audio book just a few months ago, and it is, it is amazingly how relevant it is to today. I can't remember whether I mentioned it in the book or not, but absolutely that hideous strength, you know, and technology and uh, the illumined, the you know, the advanced people, the people who know best where the world should go and how to run the world and mm -hmm. the corruption of politics and the corruption of, you know, industry and I mean, just like, and, and the seduction of people, you know, the pressure on people, hey, do you want to be one of the uh, deplorables, you know, clinging to your guns and religion, or do you want to kind of be part of the brave new world that we're creating here, you know? Mm -hmm. See, yeah. that's, that's one of the other things all of us have to keep in mind, that the forces of secularism are extremely elitist. Yes. And they very much look down on anybody who disagrees with them. They denigrate, they mock, they hate, and they yeah. try to push people into the camp of being Nazis and all sorts of other things. Yeah. It, it's just these extremes. And we have to be very clear. I don't let the multi-billionaire, elitist-led cultural uh, speakers, the people who are on yeah. the media, doing these kind of things, yeah. I don't let them sway me from Jesus Christ. They Amen. will not be the judge of my soul when I die. Right. They will not. They yeah. have to undergo their own judgment. Yeah. And this is very important. And what's at stake, and this is one of the things I think you also bring out, what is at stake is whether you go to heaven or whether you go to hell. Yeah. That, yeah. That's the bottom line here. Yeah. You are yeah. If you support deceit, the killing of innocent unborn, the killing of innocent aged people, 
and you will then allow the killing of other people. You will. Yes. Yes. And you will end up in hell. Yeah. This is oh, uh, Father. These yeah. are the things that we have to take a look at. The stakes are high. It's not mollycoddling yeah. things. Th this is the primary motivation of the book, The Salvation of Souls. Exactly. And what what, what you said there I agree with just 100 percent. You know, it's about the salvation of souls. And there's a tremendous battle going on right now for the salvation of souls. And Jesus said, don't be afraid, little flock. Mm -hmm. It's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Don't be afraid even of those who can kill the body. Be, be afraid rather of the death of the soul, body and soul yeah. in, in hell. Yeah. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Better to go to, into heaven missing an arm or a leg and you'll be restored in the resurrection of the body than to go down to hell with an intact body. So Jesus is saying, get your priorities straight. Yep. Get your priorities straight. And don't be afraid. Yep. You know, your Father in heaven knows what you need. He's going to give it to you. If you seek first the kingdom of God and seek his holiness, he's going to give you what you need to carry out the mission for which he created you. So we should have total confidence in the Lord, even like little children. Jesus says, unless you become like a little child, you will not enter the kingdom of God. Right over here on my desk over here, Father Mitch, I have a picture of St. Jacinta and St. Francisco. I am so inspired by their childlike but very mature and very deep and very holy response to the message from heaven and we all need to do the same thing we need to just trust the lord like little children and not be afraid he'll show us what to say when we need to be able to say it thank you you know i uh, i wish we could go on longer but we are running fast out of time so thank you very much for your book and for being with us and May the Lord bless you and all of our audience, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Again, you can find out more about Ralph by going to renewalministries.net. Get his book at ewtnrc.com. It's item number 238, A Church in Crisis, Pathways Forward. And... As we talked at the beginning of the program, check out our Christmas programming. But also, please keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill, because we got to pay for the satellite bills to get those programs for you. God bless you all, and thank you very much.